Okay, welcome back. Right. Okay, so we are in chapter 14, the power and blessings of the cross. Let's look at the next point. On the cross, Jesus Christ broke sin's power over our lives. Romans 6 and verse 6, very powerful verse. Let's read that, Romans 6 and 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Mm. The body of sin should be done away with because we should no longer be slaves to sin. What is a slave? When the master says, go here and do that, he has to do it. Right? You have to sit the whole night and clean this entire house, he has to do it, right? Because he's a slave. Now, slave to sin means whenever the devil is telling, you know, you are this, you are this, you do this, you do that. If we keep doing it, what happens? We become a slave to sin. But the Bible verse says in Romans 6, 6, we were slaves to sin, but now that is broken off. We are no longer a slave to sin. We sing that song, no? No longer slaves, but I am a child of God. Identity. Right? We were in Christ so that when Christ died, our old man died with him on the cross. When we say the old man, especially in the book of Romans, uh, the man refers to our sinful nature. Right? The old man, our sinful nature. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation all things have passed away the sinful nature the moment jesus died on the cross and you and i believe in that okay jesus i believe that you died on the cross for me and your blood forgives all my sins i accept you as my personal savior that moment our sin nature is crucified on the cross what is the sin nature death Death came into the world because of sin. That moment, that sin nature that we live in is crucified on the cross. Then comes Romans 12, 1 and 2. So be not, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right? Believers, not living in sin nature because it's crucified on the cross. But we have to transform we must not conform ourselves to this world but be transformed in our mind right as a believer you do not have a sinful nature because this old nature sinful nature has been crucified on the cross so that the power of sin over our lives is broken and we are no longer slaves to sin now we may say to ourselves, but this sin is too much. It is too difficult. I'm not able to come out of this. You know, it's a bondage. It's just there. I love Jesus. I love going to church. I listen to his word every day. I pray every day. But this little sin is not getting out of my life. What should I do? Everything is all right. I know. I believe in Jesus. I know that He is resurrected again. God has blessed me. Uh, you know, I go to church. I volunteer in church. I get opportunity to preach also in church. Sometimes I'm a leader in the church. Everything is okay. But this small area in my life, I'm not able to let go. It's there. It's still there. That means what? Saying we are, we are not standing on what Jesus did on the cross. Everything else is okay. But this area, no. Remember, there is no sin that the blood of Jesus cannot wipe away. Right? Everything was done on the cross. So we must know this. We must know that, hey, if this is a sin that is 
you know, keeping me in bondage. I'm being a slave to sin. The Bible says I'm not a slave. So I must work to come out of it. Right? It's like taking a step and saying, God, I don't want to do this. This is not right in my life. I know it's a hindrance for me, for me and you. So I'm going to do all I can in the natural, in the spiritual as well, to come out of it. And when we take that step, that's when we see God coming in and he will help us. Right. Second, we must reckon this to know. Reckon means we must know it as truth. Right? This is truth. This is what Jesus is saying about you. Now, we can't go to Jesus and say, but no, Jesus, uh, I, I'm, I'm a slave in one area. Other areas, I'm a child of God. Right? But altogether, it becomes a slave only. Right? If you're a slave in one area, and in 10 areas, you're a blessed child of God, still you're a slave. It becomes like, you know, there's a slave. But we must reckon, we must know this truth that we don't have to live in that. We don't have to live in that. We can come out of it. Right? You know, this uh, person recently came up to me and um, and he was saying, you know, Pastor, when I pray, you know, uh, I keep praying. I pray and I pray and I pray. But one thing happens to me. As I'm praying, I fall asleep. So then I wake up again. And I don't know where I am in the prayer, but then I pray. I say, God, help me. He's very genuine, very sweet, right? He's being very true to himself. Uh, oh, I really want to pray, but, you know, the sleep it just gets me. I'm not able to control my sleep during that time. Other times I'm able to stay awake. So he asked me, what should I do? Why is this happening? So. I said, see, it's a natural thing, right? It's a natural thing. It happens. And he's just, you know, a couple of years in the Lord. So this is a natural thing. What you do is you try different things, right? You walk around, right? sing a song, just praise him, just use scriptures, praise him, right? Uh, oh, if he, he still uh, is not able to speak in tongues. So I said, ask God for that. But you do the natural, right? You walk around. Something that helped me was when you wake up, wash your face. It clears up, you know, you feel a little better. And walk around uh, and, and keep the phone away. Keep distractions away. Right? Um, and, and see if that can help you. And he came back to me and said, Yeah, that really helped me. You know, initially I would pray for 15, 20 minutes, uh, like, you know. Uh, just focusing on God, 15, 20 minutes. But now when I walk around, I was able to sing songs. I was able to just talk to the Lord and think of Bible scriptures. And, you know, I didn't feel sleepy. I sat for some time. I stood up, is that okay? Or I should only be kneeling or I should only be sitting. Is God pleased? I said, it's not, a, you know, it's not about what we are, how we are walking, standing, kneeling. All of that are postures of worship. But it's the heart that matters. Our oneness with God, our prayer, our communion, fellowship with God that matters. And it was a simple thing. But he was able to overcome practically. Right? There was no need of, uh, oh, Holy Spirit, break this bondage. I think it was a practical thing. You sleep, you gave, wake up, we feel, uh, we feel sleepy. Just overcome it, right? Do things practically. And so he was able to. You know, one of the things that uh, we can do is, you know, even drinking a lot of water in the morning will help you to stay awake. And it helps you. Uh, just drink warm water. You feel refreshed all of a sudden. Right? And it's good. Right? So sometimes we blame the enemy for everything. And it's not. I mean, it's some things that we just need to practically do. Right? And once we practically do it, it's better. Like, for example, our bodies, you know, if we're always tired, Always weak, so I break that devil's curse over my body. No, now sometimes it's not the devil. We have to go exercise. You know, not eating healthy, not exercising healthy. Bodies become weak. Devil, I command you, the spirit of infirmity. Devil is saying, I didn't do anything. Yeah, 
you are not looking after your body what can i do right you understand what i'm saying so but then yes there are times when the enemy comes and there's unusual sicknesses which come or that we break it off uh, and so first we must know second we must reckon that this is the truth of god's word that we are no longer slaves and three we must walk in it it's not enough to know and to reckon that as truth we need to walk in it right we have to walk in it so it says there uh, romans 6 13 let's read that powerful verse and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to mm -hmm. sin but present yourself to god as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to god do not present your body or your instruments to the what is the first portion says to the the first portion 613 do not present your body to sin rather present them to righteousness to god for righteousness that means basically what is he saying here paul is saying you as a believer don't open doors for the enemy don't present yourself to the enemy so okay devil these are certain areas that those are open i'm presenting myself to those doors now the devil will say thank you very much and he will come rather present yourselves to god and say god these are my weaknesses these are places where i need to gain strength these are places where i need to walk in holiness present to god and he will work in your life don't be opening up doors for the enemy to come in he will take every small door every small door he will take right uh, so you need to close the doors shut the door you know There'll be times when you don't feel like praying, you don't feel like worshiping. You tell the devil, devil, it's not about my feeling. It's not about how I feel. I may be angry, upset, sleepy. Uh, uh, there's maybe unforgiveness, whatever's there in my heart. You shut the door to the devil and say, I am going into the presence of God through the gift of righteousness that is there given to me through the cross. Uh, the devil will say, no, you're not righteous. And you say, I am righteous. I've asked for forgiveness. I am righteous. And you just come into the presence of God. You don't have to fall into his trap. He's a master deceiver. He knows how to deceive people. But praise God for the Spirit of God inside us. And when we know that the Spirit of God is there, we, who we are, we don't have to fall into his trap. Right? On the cross, Jesus Christ annulled Satan's power over our lives. Christ triumphed on the cross. When Christ triumphed, we triumphed. We must understand that we are winners. We have dominion over Satan through the cross. We are delivered from the powers of darkness. Satan has no authority over us. Look at the last part. Except what we permit him to have. Satan has no authority over our lives except what we permit. Right? This recently a uh, 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 grieving parent, you know, they came up to me and they said, please pray for my child. She's about 13 years old and she's addicted to Instagram and Facebook. If I don't give the phone. She starts breaking things at home. She's not studying. She's not, and they said this, this, this. Right? And it, it was very sad to listen to the parents say this. 13 years old. She's using abusive language also. Right? Uh, and, but in the outside, she's very good. Outside of home, she's very good. She listens, obeys everything. The moment she gets home, she wants... Facebook, Instagram, she's recently opened her own Facebook account, 13 years old. 
So his mother was very sad, weeping. Right? And it is very sad to listen to it. And she would spend hours. What will happen to her eyes, Pastor? What will happen to her? Well, she's not studying. She's good in studies, you know, but she's been getting average marks now. Only on Facebook, Instagram. I don't know what she does. I don't know if she's addicted to other things. I really don't know. She knows how to change settings. She knows everything. What must I do? And it's a sad, it's a sad case, right? Sometimes, you know, we allow things to happen. As parents, we may not have corrected at the right time, maybe for different reasons, or sometimes it just becomes an addiction over time. And so the only thing I said was, let her cry, don't give the phone. Don't give the phone, right? let her cry. But you begin to minister. You, you have to get somebody to counsel her and talk to her. Right? Or what you can also do is, if she's using for three hours, break it down. Then I'll give you one hour. Right? Break it down. Then she asked me, why is the devil doing this? I said, see, sometimes we open doors to the enemy. We allow it to happen. Now, it was a genuine case because she's working. She had no other choice. You know, just give the phone and, you know, she had to work and do other things. But little did she know that it will come up to this. But God is bigger than our mistakes. We can't say, oh, this is the biggest mistake I've done in my life. Gone. It is all because of me. No. Christ's power is able to annul all of this. That's happening. It may be our mistake. We have opened the door. And the devil has entered the door happily and made it a tight bondage. But Christ's power is able to deliver us. Now, these, time, these things may take time, but we need to stay the course. Right? It may require counseling, continuous prayer, fasting and prayer, just being there, uh, you know, caring for the child. Because it's, he's not an adult. It's a 13-year-old girl. Right? But that's one thing that I mentioned to her. I remember I said, know that she's a child of God. So when you deal with her, deal with her as a child of God. Don't deal with her as what the enemy looks at her. Look at her as a child of God. This is just a bondage. This is something that the door is open, but she is a child of God. Right? A simple reminder of the blessings that come to us through the cross. Forgiveness of sins and restoration unto God, healing from sickness and disease. The power of sin is broken and we are sanctified by the cross. What is sanctified? What is the meaning of sanctified? Being changed, set apart. I'm searching for that one word. Come on, online students. Sanctified. Cleansed, okay. I'm searching for one word from there. Huh? Righteous. Purified. <laughs> Vijay was not sure. Okay. What else? I'm searching for one word. Like the most uh, an important word. Sanctified. Ah. Made holy. Right? Made holy, sanctified, set apart, and made holy. Why are we set apart? Not so that we know, okay, we are part of the uh, kingdom of Israel. No. Set apart to be made holy. Right? We receive wholeness. There's authority and dominion over the enemy. The blessings of Abraham are upon us. And we looked at that in the first portion, the covenants. Uh, we looked at Abraham's blessings, which included righteousness by faith, friendship with God, financial and material blessings, um, uh, material prosperity, healing and wholeness, and a lot more. Right? When God made this promise to Abraham, I will bless you, he was stating that all who God is and all that God does was being released to Abraham as a blessing. God did not need to itemize the list of blessings that fact that he said i will was more than sufficient 
right? When we look at the Abrahamic blessing, it is a long list of blessings. And when God said, I will bless you, he blessed Abraham. The blessings came from every angle. Abraham was like, <sighs> maybe in one point he said, God, what is, I can't even count how many servants I have. I can't even count how much of camels and herd I have. It's just overflowing. It's going on and on and on. <laughs> Wherever he goes. If he goes to the wilderness, he's, I mean, he's put up his tent. Wherever he goes, there's blessing. He goes for a, to fight against the, other, the enemies, there's blessing. Uh, you look at his family, there is blessing. Every angle, there's blessings. And God is saying, this Abrahamic blessing will be for generations and generations and generations. And it's for you and me as well. right? A new covenant has better promises. But remember, there are blessing stealers that we must fight against. You know, the, you know Apostle Paul was brilliant when he spoke about all of this. What did he say? He said in, uh, in, in 2 Corinthians, he says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty in God. Right Now, what is weapons for? To sit and look at it? Imagine a, a, a soldier. He's got his weapons, everything, and he's seeing the enemy come. Oh, I've got nice weapons. <laughs> I wish my sword was shining better than this. <laughs> uh, imagine he's looking at his shield and saying, is this a like a bulletproof shield. He's wasting his time. The enemy is coming. Oh, the enemy is coming. What do I do now? Common sense. Put on your shield and go. That's all he had to do. And now Paul is saying, hey, the enemy is coming. But the weapons of warfare are not carnal. They're mighty in God. They bring down strongholds, bring down arguments and reasonings. And anything that comes against the word of God. Then Ephesians 6, he says, you know, put on the, uh, the uh, armor of God. Sorry, thank you. Put on the armor of God. Now, why would you put on the armor of God? Because the devil is there. Right? So he's trying to, you know, the end of the chapter says, he has his fiery dance, but you use the shield of faith that will quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. So the devil is, you know, you can picture him hiding behind those pillars, using those fiery darts. But the moment you see the fiery dart, you put the shield of faith. The dart will just fall off. So Paul made it very clear right, that there are enemies. There are blessing stealers. There are, there, you know, in the last chapter, in his last letter, he says in 2 Timothy, he says, you fight the good fight. Right. Now, most of his life, Paul is writing, saying, you know, we are blessed. We are seated with him in heavenly places. We are children of God. We are no longer slaves. You look at all his epistles. So wonderful. But in the end, the last letter, he's saying, you fight the good fight of faith. It's not going to be easy, Timothy. But you fight it. Right. You run the race. Nobody can run it for you. You run it. And when you run, you run in the right way, and there is a reward waiting for you. You fight the good fight of faith. Right? Now, here's another important point I'd like to make. There are battles that we need to fight, but we don't have to fight every battle. Right? There are some battles you don't even have to waste time on that. So people come and say, oh, you can't do this. You know, you are this, you are this. Don't fight that battle. No, but he said like this. No, how can he say this? How can he say this? How can she say this? How did, from what mindset they're talking? You know who I am? You know what I can do? <laughs> Those are battles you don't have to fight. Choose your battle wisely. Right? To look at. Saul, I was teaching this uh, yesterday for the second years. You look at Saul, King Saul. He fought battles. Some of the battles were not really needed. 
especially when David was became famous and he was running for is it needed to go wasting his time trying to kill David? He knew that David is going to be the next king. Why is he wasting his time? You know, instead of that, what he could have done? You now he killed uh, David, used the sling, killed Goliath, and now everyone are singing, "Oh, uh, Saul killed thousands, David killed tens of thousands." Saul is standing there and saying, "Tens of thousands. He killed one fellow. I went to so many armies and I've killed, I've killed so many people. You are singing about him." He's upset. He wants to get rid of him. But he knew that God had already chosen David as king. What he could have done, he could have said, okay, David, I know that you're going to be the next king. You're a shepherd boy. Come on. I'll take you up. Come join the army. I'll train you how to use the sword, how to, you know, warfare, how to attack, how to protect your people. I'll teach you everything. So that when you're 30 or 35 years old, you can transition to being the king of Israel. Did he do that? No. He wasted his time trying to fight battles that were not even required. But on the other side, God made it a, a way of training for David. God made him wait 17 years to become the king. Of course, that became a training for him. But Saul. He shouldn't have fought those battles, they're not when required. So you and I can choose our battles. Don't fight every battle, right? whatever the enemy brings against you. Right? <clears throat> Everyone with me? Right. OK, shall we go to the next one? Is it too much? Let's go to, let's do as much as we can, uh, can finish quickly. From the cross to the throne, now, this is really interesting. Right, really interesting. Um, on the cross, what did Jesus say? His last words, second last words, I say. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, we talked about this during the mentoring hour, right? Uh, Pastor explained the whole thing of uh, paradise, but let's go over it again for our online students as well. Um, Luke 23 24, 43. Uh, so Jesus is on the cross. He tells the thief who repented, today you will be with me in paradise. And then again, uh, Jesus talking in Matthew chapter 12, he says, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, the same way the son of man will be, um, you know, will be put away for, and he will rise again on the third day. Now let's go to Abraham's bosom, the old paradise. Right now, this is really interesting. In the Old Testament, the word Hades was called Sheol, right? Now, what is Hades? Hades is divided into two parts, right? So one part is Abraham's bosom, one part is paradise, right? So you look at this. The, now, the same word in Hebrew in the Old Testament and in the New Testament is different, right? So hell. The Greek word is Hades, uh, which is revealed as the place of departed human spirits between death and resurrection. Right. So in the New Testament, when they say uh, Hades, it refers to this place where people who are dead. Right. And their spirits before the resurrection. Right. Now, this old this word hell is equivalent to the Old Testament word Sheol. Now you'll see the word Sheol in the book of in Psalms, in Isaiah, Jeremiah. You'll see these the word Sheol. Uh, now let's look at what is this? What is this whole thing of Hades? Where is it now? Where's it gone? Is it still there? Um, who's there in it? And all of that. Hades before the ascension of Christ. Now, this passage occurs in many places. Uh, the passage in this word occurs, make it, makes it clear that Hades was a, a place with two divisions. One, Abraham's bosom, and two is uh, paradise. Both designations was, um, was separated by a gulf, meaning there was it was one place of torment 
and the other place was a place of rest right abraham's bosom and then you have uh, a place of torment right now when jesus died on the cross what did he say today you will be with me in paradise right remember lazarus he goes he dies he goes to abraham's bosom it's a place of rest right uh, and he was at peace there but where did the rich man go he went to hell and hell was a place of yeah but it was a place of torment right? not exactly fire but a place of torment because later on jesus says uh, you know they'd be put into the lake of fire uh, but it was a place of torment right torment torment means um uh, uh, extreme pain right so there's going to be two kinds of pain one is the physical pain and then is the the soul the pain the separation right so uh, when lazarus was in hell this place of torment he could feel right he could feel the burns revelation says they will seek death but they will not find it right and what does uh, this one say uh, the rich man says send somebody i just need a drop of water so there was this physical urge as well. Then he says, oh, the soul is there. The soul is saying, my brothers are there. Go and tell them what is happening. Right? So the soul aspect also was there of that pain. I don't want my brothers to go through what I'm going through. So you see two things. Right? One was the physical pain. One was the soul. Now the same thing in heaven. Uh, like now, now I'm talking about after the cross, right? In heaven, you and I will. So there was Abraham's bosom. It's a place of rest. The soul is at rest. There's no torment, right? There's no, you know, devil trying to torment. There's no pain. There's no physical pain. Nothing. It's just a place of rest. It's like when you wake up in the morning, you have nothing to do but you're having a cup of tea, and it's a place of rest. On Abraham's bosom, there may not be tea, but it's a place of rest. Right? No problem. Just the soul is at peace, the body is at peace, everything is peace. Now, this rich man who is there in hell, he's burning, there's physical pain, the soul is in pain, and he's looking into Abraham's bosom. He's saying, Hey, I know you. Right? Now, after the cross, what happened? Ephesians 4, he went down, he took captivity captive, right? So what did Jesus do? He the, This whole place, this paradise, right? He went there, he took people, he took those who are in this place of rest, right? And he ascended into heaven, right? So now who's there in Abraham's bosom? Nobody. Right? But what happened to hell? Hell, which was the place of torment, becomes this place which is the lake of fire, a place where Satan will be banished forever. So you got the picture now? Yes? You want me to explain again? Those online? Uh, you want me to explain this portion again? Okay, okay, I'll explain it for those here. Yeah. Just give him the mic. No? Uh, Pastor, uh, like that rich man, he died. So he is not in physically in hell. He's a spirit in hell. So how can a spirit be thirsty and yeah. how can a spirit be like physically burned? Yeah. So it is like this. See, how in the God has made it in a way. Now, see, Jesus was in a glorified body, right? In the glorified body, all the doors were closed. But Jesus came in and he said, peace be unto you. Right? Then what did he tell Thomas? Thomas, you're doubting. No, come here. You touch. You touch and see. So he touched Jesus, right? 
Jesus could feel, obviously, he could feel the marks. And he said, you know, touch my side also. Touch my side, right? Jesus didn't say, initially, what did Jesus say? Don't touch me. I haven't yet gone. Remember to uh, Mary to Mary Magdalene at the tomb? She said, don't touch me yet. But here, after the glorified body, Jesus saying, you touch, come and touch me. So a glorified body, just like how in heaven we can experience uh, you know, in Revelations, in the last chapter says, that we will we will drink of the river that flows there. Right? There'll be a river, the river of life flowing. Now, if I want to experience, you see, Jesus also says, I'm building mansions for you in heaven. Now, if I want to experience something nice, my physical thing should be there, right? The, the physical, the, the attributes of enjoying the things. So God has made the glorified body in a way that we can experience the good things in heaven. We can experience it. Right? The freshness, the, the presence of God, uh, the fullness of God, the things that he's, that is available in heaven. The same way in hell, there's no point of them being in hell. Hey, I put you to hell and there nothing is happening. The fire is there and they're all like chewing gum and standing. Nothing's happening to me. There's no point of that. So the point of hell was it's a place of torment, right? So God has designed it in a way that they will get such a body that they will burn. Their hands, the, the feeling of the burn will be there, but it's not burn. They do not need a bandage like this. They will only experience the pain. It's not like a natural body where you burn the body, it'll become ashes. Right? It's not like that. You may be in like in the fire. Right? In the fire. Like, like the, the furnace is there. Oh, it's burning. Not like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were not struggling, right? But you know, they'll be in the fire, they'll be burning. And you're waiting for that burning sensation to stop, but it's not stopping. I didn't understand what you're saying. Use the mic, no? The illusion of you burning in the fire will be so real that you won't know it's illusion, you'll feel it's real. Yeah, so you'll feel it's real, but it is real, but the outcome is not real. You know, uh, in the natural, you burn something, it becomes ashes, it's done. But in hell, it, it's going to be a, such a place of torment where, you know, even even that burns, you'll feel it, but it'll it'll not you'll not burn out. It'll still be there, and this is for eternity. And on the other side, we are with eternity with God in His presence, enjoying. So the choice is so open, right? And, and that is why Jesus, He came on the cross because He didn't want people to go to this place. right? But those who willfully disobey, that's the place. That's the outcome. right? So now you got... Abraham's bosom, Hades, and then you got now this, this Abraham's bosom will go up, right? It just goes and, it, and now there's heaven and there is hell, right? So nobody is there in Abraham's bosom now. Paul says to be absent in the body is to be present with Abraham or to be present with the Lord. Yes, right? to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord, right? So that's going to happen, and then later on, we, uh, you know, like we discussed, there will be the um, the judgment seat of Christ for those who are believers. Uh, we'll stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ. This judgment is called the bema seat, where we will be given rewards. It's not about going heaven hell. It's rewards what you have done, and then in the end, uh, the in in Revelations we see the great white throne judgment, where Death and Hades will give up everyone, right? And everyone, that is for the unbelievers, they will stand before the great white throne 
judgment. And the Bible says that they will have to give an account of their lives. Meaning they'll have to say, why you didn't believe? What happened? Why you didn't believe? It's a scary thing. Right? But it's such a joy to know that all we have to do is believe in Jesus. And we have a great, great kingdom ahead of us. Right? This is not to put fear in us. right? Oh, we are children of God. And we thank God for calling us. Right? That we are no longer part of what the enemy is doing. But we are part of what God is doing. Right? Uh, the Lord Jesus made a proclamation to the spirits in prison. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20. Let's read that. Uh, Nina, you have a question? Please go ahead. Can I unmute and speak? Yes, okay? go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this thing about now those who have gone ahead, I mean, who have died in the Lord already. So we, we've just looked and said that if we are uh, absent from the body, then we are present with the Lord. Yeah. So, uh, and we, I mean, when we looked at the example of uh, uh, the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man was able to, uh, you know, go through all the, whether, whether it was the tongue or eyes or everything. So that, is that a spiritual body? Is that a kind of a spiritual body that people who have gone to be with the Lord already? So is that talking about a spiritual body? Because we are all, I mean, believers now or later, mm -hmm. there is a resurrection that's going to happen, right? So that is different, isn't it? Yes. Is that different? Yeah, that's different, right? Resurrection, the resurrected body. Yes, that's a good question. So, so what's going to happen is, so let me just uh, paraphrase Nina's question. Thank you, Nina, for asking the question. Yes. Now, Nina's question was, uh, the the one who died and went to hell, you know, the rich man, could feel, right, the uh, the burns they could feel was feeling thirsty, but now we are absent of the body, present with the Lord. So her question was, will we be feeling the things in heaven, right? Now, the answer is, during the rapture, right, in the book of Thessalonians, it says that the Lord will come on the clouds, right, with, this, with the saints, that is, with the holy ones, and, in a, and those here on earth, and those spirits up in heaven, that is, those who are absent in the body, present with the Lord, their spirits, they will, we will all meet in the clouds in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed with a glorified body. Right? So, the, to answer your question, Nina, right now, our spirit is with the Lord. Right? We are with the Lord. But the resurrected body, that body that we need, will come during the time of the rapture. Right? So when the rapture comes, we will get a glorified body. And those here on earth will see him just as he is. And we will all have a glorified body and we'll go up into heaven. Right? So, Nina, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, if uh, I mean, if Jesus went, sorry, I just have one more question, if you don't mind. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, they see when Jesus was resurrected and he came back, Yes. Uh, he had a meal with his disciples, right? Yes. So, which means that the, the body is made in such a way, of course, he could walk through doors and all mm -hmm. of that. It had that kind of power. But he made a meal and he had the meal with them. So, it is kind of a very different kind of body that is that the, I mean, that's the kind of body we're going to have, right? Later, glorified. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. So, so when we the can Lord do all, the, yeah, all those things in the normal that we do. <laughs> Is it going to be like that? I mean, I'm just going by the example of what Jesus did. So I'm just asking that. Yeah. So, so when Jesus came back, uh, you know, so what happened was he came back. He could, when he was in his glorified body, yes, he walked through the doors, but he he still had that flesh, right? He said to Thomas, "Come and touch me, touch my side," uh, and he also uh, had food. Uh, now that is the glorified body that Jesus had. And that is the same kind of body that you and I will have. But the point is, it's not like the, in, when we go to heaven, we'll be hungry and we want to eat. That's the, 
uh, that's not the point but the glorified body given to us for uh, you know uh, after the rapture the glorified body that we have is so that you and i can experience the 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 presence of god right we can experience and taste and feel uh, the goodness of God, the presence of God, and what is available up in heaven for us. So, yes, it is the same kind of body. Right? Is that okay, Nina? Okay. All right. Any other questions? Go ahead. I'm pastor, like uh, relating to um, like um, before uh, Jesus' uh, resurrection and uh, before he took um, all the people who were um, in Abraham's bosom to heaven. I mean, what about those people? I mean, who lived before Abraham? I mean, what about Noah and the others? Who like, lived before Abraham? Abraham. Yeah, why is it telling Abraham's bosom and not about Noah and the Adam, the others? Okay, okay, we don't know why it's not uh, Moses's bosom or uh, uh, you know Noah's bosom. Uh, the reason is God made a covenant with Abraham. Right? Uh, I believe that. Uh, so He chose Abraham's bosom, like uh, chose the name Abraham's bosom. But uh, those who um, who died during the old covenant were in that place. So even if it was Moses and the ones before that, they were in that place. The name of the place is Abraham's bosom. Right? Now, why is it named Abraham's bosom? That I don't know. Right? Uh, but everyone were there. The place of rest, it was a place of rest. Right? So even those before Abraham would have been there. Okay. All right. So we run out of time. Uh, let's just quickly close in prayer. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for uh, just giving us this opportunity to just learn together. And I pray, God, that even as we study today about the cross and this divine exchange that you have done for us, O oh God, I pray that each one of us will know, will reckon, and walk uh, in this identity of who we are in you, Lord. We thank you. We pray that uh, you will teach us, Lord, and empower us by your Holy Spirit. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you, students online. Have a good week.